we haven't had anything like this in Santa Cruz County before, and, and I hope to God we never have anything like this again. He then opens the door to the confessional, and he stabs the priest in the heart. Soon, I think, that he was doing what he was supposed to do, he was called upon to do, and being a perfectly good citizen, he went about his duties, when his duties included killing people. God would start talking to you right now if you were really that kind of ill, because I grew up with people like that. Where? Between October 13th, 1972 and February 13th, 1973, I did in fact murder 13 people. My name is Herbert William Mullen and I was born on April 18th, 1947 at 6.06 a.m. My earliest memory was I was crawling on my hands and knees, and I was looking into a puddle. I saw myself, and the redwood trees reflected, and the sunlight, the sun, and I touched the sun with my finger, and it created little circular waves extending outward in all directions. I felt peaceful and calm, inquisitive, curious, content, grateful, and hopeful. April 18, 1947, is also the date of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 and the date of Albert Einstein's passing. In Herb's perverted mentality, both of these events would make him feel he was the one, and the leader of his generation. Herb was a one-year-old boy when the diarrhea pandemic happened in 1947. When he was five years old, his family relocated to a San Francisco suburb where many were involved in farming. And by all accounts, the Mullins were a well-adjusted, well-educated family. Herbert Mullin was regarded as intelligent and gentle-natured as a kid. Herb and his elder sister went to a private school. I entered uh, St. Stephen's Grammar School. I was a good student, I think, from my point of view. I always did my homework at night. I was always on first team. Uh, I was a pretty good athlete. I thought that it was leading me towards a, uh, a beneficial uh, lifetime, you know, so that I could be a good member of my family and the community. I'd been dating a girl uh, during 1964, 65, and 66, and 67. 1967, we became engaged to be married. I think that is basically when uh, mental health issues started to uh, take my fiance and my friends uh, were going along with the idea of my parents that I should be kept naive, gullible, and immature. Bill Mullen was a World War II military hero, known for being tough but never harsh. He was proud of his service, told his kid war stories, and even taught him how to shoot a pistol. Occasionally, the elder Mullen boxed with his son before supper, which Herb later saw as a lethal challenge. Although his parents were very religious, Herbert believed that Jesus Christ was a lie, and children who were forced to study religion, like he was, could receive telepathic messages telling them to kill themselves or others. I was thoroughly indoctrinated into the ideas and concepts and belief systems of Roman Catholicism. Many of those doctrines and concepts require a great deal of faith that isn't based on logic or reasoning. I think that was detrimental to my mental health. The fact that his family would not allow him to be bisexual, and he was not allowed to join the Marine Corps or Coast Guard, also made him murderous. As far as Herbert is concerned, his father did not give him a blowjob and none of his family members gave him orgasms, which Herbert thought should have started happening by age six. This is true retrospectively, and Herbert appeared to be doing well at the time. This may have been a sign of schizophrenic thinking, during his sophomore year of high school, the Mullins moved to Felton, a small town in Santa Cruz County surrounded by stunning redwoods. Though he was relocated at a young age, 
Herb made many friends and was a popular kid. A football star with a steady girlfriend, Herb was chosen as the most likely to succeed. Herb attended Cabrillo College and studied engineering after graduating in 1965. Everything was going well until paranoid schizophrenia altered everything. The terrible loss of Herb's best friend, Dean Richardson, in a vehicle accident the summer following his graduation stands out as the trigger for his failing sanity. Angry, Herb erects shrines in his chamber dedicated to Dean, and spends hours alone in them. He grew fascinated with the notion of being reborn after wondering whether Dean's death was some type of cosmic sacrifice. Despite his Catholic upbringing, Herb started researching Eastern faiths to find answers to the sorrow of a lost friend and the voices that were haunting him. He then changed his major from engineering to philosophy at the public college he attended, but gave it up after a couple of weeks. Two illegal drugs that I was uh, became familiar with was marijuana and uh, LSD. In the spring of 1966, when Herb was 18, he ran across Dean's friend Jim Gianera at the beach. Gianera handed him some marijuana, and informed him about the anti-war movement. He finished his first year of college in June, at 19, and began working as a summer laborer for a rural road crew. His first trip on LSD was in October, during which he blamed Gianera, saying that the cannabis he provided caused brain damage and he would have been an artist if Gianera had given me some alcohol instead. His long-term partner was alienated by his unexpected involvement with LSD. Apparently, a big earthquake was coming to California, so he decided to move to Canada. His fiancée was so freaked out that he gave her the chills with his strange gazes and rants, but she stuck with him through his struggles. Herb was 20 years old and interested in Eastern religions, heavy marijuana, and LSD. And due to his normal behavior as a kid, the Mullins thought his sudden behavior was drug-induced. After all, it was the late 1960s in Santa Cruz, when marijuana plantations and acid experiments thrived in the crannies of the Loma Prieta Mountains. Here, the counterculture flourished where hippies lived off the land, women hitched, and fifth graders sold drugs at school. On the surface, Herb's rebellious behavior appeared typical of the times. But drugs were a part of his life, and he started calling himself a Vietnam War conscious objector, which freaked out his military bred dad. His behavior, however, became scarier as time went on. After leaving San Jose State, he became an anti-war activist and had his first sexual encounter with a man in 1968. In the end, Loretta broke up with him in 1968 after telling her he was bisexual. His bisexuality became apparent, as did his violent personality. As a 21-year-old, he was arrested for marijuana possession, but was given probation after accepting responsibility for a lower charge. In his first job at Goodwill Industries, he was responsible for managing a retail outlet. In October, Herb was given conscientious objector status after his father told the draft board that Herb was a peaceful person. However, in February 1969, he announced his resignation from his employment and his intention to travel to India to study yoga. After that, he visited his sister in Sebastopol, California. However, his sister didn't like him staying, and the red flag was raised when Herbie mimicked his brother-in-law in every move. He checked himself into Mendocino State Hospital with ecopraxia, drug addiction, and schizophrenia symptoms. During his six-week stay, he was prescribed antipsychotic medicine. He was 22 years old when he checked out of the hospital in May 1969. His prognosis was deemed dismal as he was recalcitrant to the treatment plan. After leaving the hospital, Herbie approached his sister for sex, and when she refused, he asked if his brother-in-law would sleep with him. And that's when the family realized that schizophrenia is a horrible mental condition that can ruin a young adult's life. They fear for Herbie's well-being but also fear for their safety. By that time, Herbie started hearing voices. Strong paranoia of others, and delusional thinking are typical symptoms in the late teens to early twenties. 
He moved to Lake Tahoe in 1969 with another recently discharged patient and found a job as a dishwasher at Harvey's Wagon Wheel Casino Resort. Eventually, he left his job after threatening to stab a park ranger who asked him to leave with a knife, but he didn't. He was arrested and taken to the county jail, but he was never booked. He started burning his penis repeatedly in the fall of 1969 after entering therapy at a Santa Cruz, California, drug rehab center. When he attempted to commit homosexual acts with one of his friends, a physician saw the signs of schizophrenia, and urged the sheriff to commit him. A mental illness caused Herb to be a danger to himself, others, and he was profoundly disabled. After eight weeks of treatment, he was identified as a paranoid schizophrenic and came out as a straight homosexual. When he was released in February 1970, Herbie never returned to the clinic, didn't participate in group therapy, and didn't take his prescription. And he'll start working at a holiday, in as a dishwasher in a few weeks. In March, he left his home and began living in a modest hotel, which he could afford with assistance payments. In a few weeks, he was befriended by Pat Brown, and they even traveled together to Hawaii in the summer. However, Pat abandoned him, and poor Herbie checked himself into a Maui mental health facility. He was released in July as improved and asked for help paying for a flight home. And he was arrested for possession and drug use a few days after returning. And without his prescription, he got manic in jail and sang at top volume. Herbie was released from custody after being taken to the hospital's psychiatric unit, California law prohibits hospitals from holding involuntary mental patients for more than 72 hours. He returned to Cabrillo College to pursue a psychology degree, but always missed his counseling sessions. During this time, he began a homosexual relationship and worked as a Goodwill Industries driver. Wearing a black sombrero and shaving his head, he also pretended to speak with a Mexican twang. In May, 23 years old, Herbie relocated to San Francisco, away from his family's watchful eye, where he shared an apartment with junkies and mental patients. There, he made a new friend named Alan Hansen, who encouraged him to think that the voices he was hearing were indeed telepathic messages, from God telling him that he was destined for great things. He also read extensively about Leonardo da Vinci's art and grew enamored with it. And then he realized he was born on the same day Einstein was buried, and also that's when Satan got into him and made him do things he never wanted to do. He decided it was no fluke and must have been meant for a unique career. Herb started training at the Newman Herman gym and boxing at the amateur level in September. Trainers had to drag him away from his opponent because he wouldn't stop attacking him. If left alone, he chattered loudly and pounded the speed bag until his knuckles were bloodied. Then, in March of 1972, he competed in the Golden Gloves tournament, but Herbie quit boxing after losing his first bout, intending to become a priest. At 25, he moved back in with his parents, where his resentment towards his father grew, his medication stopped, and the voice gave him a clear message to kill people. These weren't murderous acts but rather acts of sacrifice. And to top it off, a big earthquake is expected to destroy California in the coming months, but he had a plan to save Californians. In October 1972, he began working as a busboy at a local restaurant. And on a rainy morning, Herbie found a baseball bat in the garage and a homeless man walking alone in the Santa Cruz Mountains. He pretended to pull over because of mechanical issues and killed the man by hitting him twice over the head with the baseball bat. Leaving the lifeless body of the would-be good Samaritan by the roadside, Herbie drove away. And then the ball started rolling. Lawrence White was a simple target that was not overlooked. The 55-year-old vagrant slept beneath bridges and in the woods to avoid being hassled between visits in the drunk tank. When his damaged body was recovered days later, he was a blank, scarcely noted in the press. No one attended his burial, and no one went searching for his murderer. As White resembled Jonah from the Bible, he told Herbie a psychic message. Toss me in the ocean, kill me to save others. And that truly triggered Herbie to be a serious artist, and he should do what the famous sculptor did. At the time, 
Herb's mom gave him the Michelangelo book to inspire him to paint as a way to release his emotions. Michelangelo secretly studied the human body to learn about it for his paintings, sculptures, and other works. Read Irving Stone's biography of Michelangelo, The Agony and the Ecstasy. And that's when Herbie found that he was better than everyone else, and his insights differed. Maybe his mom gave him the book as a hint for her son to dissect himself, in a rare display of parental rage. But the only thing Herbie learned was to put a heinous murder to his spree. On October 24, Mary Gilfoyle was late for a job interview and did what many young women in Santa Cruz did despite the warnings, she grabbed a ride. Gilfoyle, 24, has undoubtedly heard the cautionary tales of missing women last seen hitchhiking, raped, or discovered decapitated. Just a few blocks from Edmund Kemper duplex, she stood waving for strangers, asking for a simple ride. And despite not meeting Eddie, she misjudged the guy driving the 58 Chevy station wagon who pulled up alongside her. Despite that, the doe-eyed, slender driver didn't seem lecherous. He was attractive, soft-spoken, and not much taller than she was. Herbie drove her into a quiet side street, grabbed a hunting knife, and stabbed Gilfoyle in the chest and back. Then, in a lonely place on the hillside road, he dug her body up and unraveled her organs. Herbie used to think he could see people's thoughts, but he is now seeking to find out what's inside them. And whatever he saw was enough to deter him from doing this hideous and horrific autopsy again. If he were truly commanded to murder by voices, that would indicate obsessive brutality. I was a good Catholic. I said my prayers every day. I went to church every Sunday. I made sure that I went to confession at least once a month. Herbie wandered into a church in Los Gatos, just over the hills from Santa Cruz, on November 2nd, All Souls Day, one of the holiest Catholic rituals. After drinking, he decided to travel to St. Mary's Catholic Church to give him the strength to never attempt to kill again. Herbie believed the church was empty until he heard Father Henri Tomei in one of the booths and thought, well, if he is in here, I guess I should murder him. After confessing to Father Henry Tomei, he viciously stabbed him to death. He then opens the door to the confessional and he stabs the priest in the heart. The tragic murder of 65-year-old Tomei, a hero of the French resistance effort during World War II, horrified the town. Civic leaders and police officers attended his burial, hoping to catch Herbie. However, he would never show his face. Still, he did leave fingerprints at the crime scene. The thing that was so awful about it was that the priest was even after being stabbed, dying, bleeding to death, still said words to the effect that he forgave him for what he had done. By killing Father Tomei, Herbie seems to have gotten close to the motivation of his rage, which was his strict Roman Catholic father. Herbie now wanted to placate his father and sought to follow in his footsteps by joining the military services. This was consistent with his regular habit of killing and making up, as he had previously shown. It looked like joining the military was the best option, that way, he could satisfy his need for violence while enjoying the support of the state. He submitted his application to join the Coast Guard in November. After being informed in December that he had not passed the psychological examination, he relapsed into his paranoid state, believing someone was out to get him. The hippies and the war resistors were to blame, they were the ones who drugged him and coaxed him into being a conscientious objector. Now, the voices were audible once again, pleading for a sacrifice to be made. And this time, he was going after the ones who had been responsible for the destruction of his life. John Hooper, a long-time acquaintance and someone who also used drugs, was the target of his hunting knife. But after noticing nine other people present, Herbie decided it was time to improve his murdering technique by buying a firearm. However, after getting the gun, he decided to postpone the execution of the flower children. Instead, he decided to submit his application to the Marine Corps. And after his persistent persuasion, 
the recruiting sergeant eventually agreed to endorse him to join the military. He has an intense desire to join the United States Marine Corps and is quite eager to do so. And since his application was approved, he had a goal to work for, which filled his heart with excitement. Although Herbie had passed the medical and psychological tests required for joining, he was discharged when he refused to sign his criminal record in January 1973. The skinny man was inconsolable and railed angrily at his parents for not raising him as they should. They had listened to enough of Herb's rantings and eventually told him it was time to say goodbye. On January 19, he found himself alone in a shabby apartment, allowing his resentments to fester as the voices told him to murder Jim Gianera. His high school friend had sold him cannabis, a drug that Herbie thought might have worsened his mental condition. Gianera also told him about the peace movement, which led all of society to hate him, and even tricked him out of buying land. Angry and left to his own devices, Herbie decided Gianera had to go. Ironically Herbert Mullen and Edmund Kemper were both randomly leaving victims throughout the county of Santa Cruz at the same time, however, with signs of two different modus operandi. The police were left baffled, not knowing that they, indeed, had two serial killers running loose through the city streets. I was talked into using LSD by other people that I knew at that particular time, people that I had gone to high school with. When the fourth victim, I asked that guy if uh, he had any marijuana. I know that both marijuana and LSD were very, very detrimental to my mental health. On January 25, 1973, Herbie was visiting a shack community tucked away on a muddy road near the mystery spot. He waited for Kathy Francis to come to the door of the wooden cabin she shared with her husband, Bob, and their two children. David, who was nine years old, and Demon, who was four years old. When Kathy came, she told him that Jim and his wife, Joan, had moved into a new home on Western Avenue. After thanking her, he headed for his friend's new place. In a few knocks, Herbie was welcomed into Gianera's home. Gianera was then shot, and as he attempted to flee the scene, he pulled himself upstairs, where his wife was taking a bath. Herbie went after him and ended up shooting them both in the head. Then he stabbed the Gianeras with his hunting blades until they were rendered useless. However, Herbie's day was far from over. As with many of his previously gruesome crimes, he decided to return to Mystery Spot Road. And then he went to Kathy to return the favor, and properly cover up his crime. This, along with her two sons, was the most logical decision he would make out of all his crime spree. He threw open the cabin door, aimed his gun inside, and began firing. His station wagon was parked down the road to prevent it from being bogged down in the mud. He fatally shot Kathy in the chest and the head, then shot and killed the two boys while playing Chinese checkers on their bunk bed. Even though it appeared that all three of them had already passed away, he stabbed them anyhow. It was, uh, you know, cops never want to admit that they get afraid, but I'll tell you, not knowing who the suspect is, not knowing if the suspect is going to come back. Everybody has gone from this mountain except for us two and the deceased. I'd say we, we were afraid. According to the authorities in the area, the massacre appeared to be a drug burn. Bob Francis and Jim Gianera were both well known in their communities as marijuana traffickers. After the police located Bob Francis and determined that he was not a suspect in the case, they asked him to suggest any further candidates. And unfortunately, Herb Mullen's name was nowhere to be found on the extensive list that Bob compiled of people who dealt drugs with him or competed with him. In fact, Jim Gianera hadn't seen Herbie since 1971, when he paid a visit and used 10 hits of acid. On February 5, 1973, the number of female hitchhikers began a steady decline, and some of the victims had their heads severed. On the same day, 
Alice Lou and Rosalind Thorpe were last seen before they vanished. Despite this, college students persisted in hitchhiking, claiming it was a way of life. And with scrap wood and plastic sheets, the Card brothers built a makeshift tent in Henry Cowell State Park to stay out of Ranger's way. It became known as the Garden of Eden, and on February 10, the four teenagers living there were about to be permanently evicted. Herb Mullen, who imagines himself an angel of vengeance, would have been so furious he wouldn't have noticed the camp official's anger. While Herbie was aimlessly strolling around the woods, he entered the unauthorized campground. Even though the four lads, Brian Scott Card, David Olicker, Robert Spector, and Mark Drabelbiss, let him in, Herbie was antagonistic. Because the lads were defacing government property, he asked that they pack up their belongings and leave immediately. The young men laughed at Herbie, who was frowning and looking comical in his determination to enforce the law. While they were arguing, Herbie decided to murder them. Herb claims he asked them telepathically if he could help them, and they all said yes. He then took out his gun and shot them all. The sight of devastation in the woods, discovered a week later by the brother of one of the victims, depicted a furious fight that lasted longer than a compassionate few seconds. While the investigation was on for the four teenage boys, the bones of Mary Guilfoyle were discovered on February 12th. The police reiterated their previous warnings about the risks of hitchhiking and urged young ladies to avoid riding in strangers' vehicles. They referred to it as Russian roulette in their analogy. The warning, however, did not seem to ring true with the person, Herbie would attack the following morning. Still, one would not have expected death, wandering around in the front yard at 8 in the morning. On February 13th, Crazy Herbie intended to transport some firewood to his parents' residence. However, he received a psychic communication from his father, which stated, don't deliver a stick of wood until you murder somebody. When Herb argued against it, the voice became less specific and indicated, just murder anybody. While Herbie thought the young campers represented his own flower child period that he now wished to rid himself of, strangely enough, Perez, the next victim, was someone he aspired to become, and he respected him. The morning was quiet and cloudy, and Fred Perez was working in his yard when Herbie drove by and saw him. He shot him once in the heart to terminate the former prize boxer's life. As Herbie sat in his vehicle for a short time, holding the murder weapon, he slowly retreated and began pulling away from the gathering. But this time, Herbie was not so lucky because there was a witness, a neighbor heard the shooting, and while looking out her window, she caught a glimpse of the murderer's car. Joan Stognaro heard the shot, saw the license plate, and then called the police. A few minutes later, Herbie drove into Felton in his Chevrolet station wagon filled with firewood for his parents. He was pulled over and taken into custody without resisting. In the police station, Herbie pouted and refused to communicate with the officers, even when they asked him innocuous questions. He had to see a doctor, and the doctor at the police station was shocked to see the gaudy tattoos on his abdomen. They read Eagle Eyes Marijuana and Legal Eyes Acid. Other tattoos read Birth, Maha Shemadi, and Kriya Yoga. Strange tattoos for someone who seemed to care for themselves and disliked hippies very much. When the police searched his house, they discovered a Bible, the paperback book Einstein, The Life and Times, an address book with Jayanara mentioned, and newspaper stories concerning the recent killings in his modest flat. But ballistic evaluations were conducted when the pistol was discovered in his station wagon, and Herbie was accused of six murders. Desperate to find out whether or not it was the same murderer. On February 17, two days after the initial discovery, the campers' bodies were found, bringing the total number of fatalities to ten. However, now that they had a suspect in jail, the Santa Cruz authorities investigated recent unsolved homicides in the hopes of connecting them to Herbie. They also compared the bones of Mary Guilfoyle to the remains of other women whom the investigators located. By then, the fingerprints discovered in the church in Los Gatos, were presented by the local authorities. And by now. Herbie has been charged with ten counts of murder, which don't include his first three victims, Lawrence White, Father Henri Tomei, 
or Mary Guilfoyle. Everyone agreed that Herbert Mullin was responsible for the deaths of at least 10 people. At the trial, it will be decided whether or not he was legally insane when he committed the crime. And if it was decided that Herbie lacked the mental capacity to understand the nature of his actions, he would be judged not guilty. It would not be possible to convict him of first-degree murder if he could not comprehend the significance of his actions. Herbie was persuaded that if he sat in his cell and constantly penned his philosophical musings, he could decipher the larger meaning behind his murder. Among other things, he wrote pieces on Jonah, Albert Einstein, and earthquakes. These irrational worldviews paid off for him, but not as he expected. These odd notes could be crucial evidence for the defense to demonstrate that he is insane. While Herbie was waiting for his trial, he encountered Edmund Emil Kemper, the second homicidal madman, who had been terrorizing Santa Cruz. Someone had the bright idea of putting Kemper and Herbie in adjacent cells. Perhaps, they thought it would be funny, to put two mass murderers who interacted in a way similar to fire and brimstone. Actually, what's strange is that uh, another serial killer from Santa Cruz, Herb Millen, uh, grew up hating John Wayne, actually. I wouldn't blame him. I was in a jail cell right next to him for months, and I was in prison up in the hole here in the lockup unit for uh, going on three years with him, about two, two and a half years. And at one point, I got him a job in the kitchen. I was already on the kitchen crew, and the sergeant pulled me aside and asked me to talk to the guys about him coming on the crew, because he'd alienated a lot of the guys, and they were afraid there'd be violence. Uh, I knew Herbie. Um, but little Herbie was, when I met him in Redwood City Jail, OK, our first meeting was I bumped him out of the priority cell, where they could look from the office and see through the steel door, the glass in the door, and see him physically, or they could watch the monitor and watch him. He got bumped next door. There was a shower in the priority cell. Never had to leave the cell. For him to shower from the other cell, he had to go out into the main area. They had to lock everybody in one of the, uh, uh, I guess you call them tanks. They moved 15 guys, 30 guys out of the tank into the activity area. They'd walk him around into their tank. He'd shower. He'd come back out. And all the way over there and all the way back, they're cat calling him. They're calling him names. They're yelling because he caused them great interruption in their day, right? He resented that. He got bumped out of the priority cell into a non-shower cell. I got the shower cell, right? So he wasn't too friendly at first. And I'd say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mullen. I says, do you have a bar of soap? There's no soap over here. He took it all with him. He had no need for it, but he took it with him. And he'd say yes, and I'd say, well, can I use a bar of it? He said, no. And I'd say, oh, I've got one of these little shits here. And he, what it is, he's a little wimpy guy that hates big guys because he always feels intimidated by them, right? And that's how we started out. So I started thinking about that. And I went back to my old relationships in therapy and group therapy and Tascadero and youth authority and stuff. And I'm saying, OK, well, we can deal with this. So I started, I said, well, I have to be kind to him. So I found out something he liked. He loved planters' peanuts, the little bags of peanuts shelled peanuts and uh, so I bought 20 30 bags of them I didn't care for them myself and uh, I offered him some one day and they were both on camera 24 hours a day so I said Herbie would you like some peanuts and he'd say yeah and I say oh I got to him right down to the inner core there yeah this little childhood thing comes out I says oh here and he was fascinated by this thought of gee he's just giving me some peanuts and I didn't do anything for him uh, I don't know him, he, you know, I'm not being nice to him, why would he give me some peanuts? So he comes over to the bars, we can't even see each other, and I reach out with these peanuts around the side, and I see this little hand come out, and it, it, I thought of it almost as a little monkey paw. That's what it seemed like, so innocent, and this little, little hand comes out, starts to reach for the peanuts, and then, he, and then he hesitated, and he pulls back, and I thought, oh geez, he's defensive, he's thinking I'm gonna grab his hand and rip his arm off or something, I'm this great big guy, right? So without saying anything, I just reached around and I laid them on the bars and then pulled my hand away. And he took them and he enjoyed them and all of that. And I'd say later, I'd say, gee, uh, Herbie, did you eat all those peanuts? And he'd say, I oh, know, I still got some left. I said, well, I got plenty more. I said, go ahead and enjoy them. So what I did is I started giving him bags of peanuts. 
And he had this horrible habit. There's guys back in the tank, and he and I are in these cells facing them through three bars, three sets of bars. And I can't see him, and he can't see me. I don't know where on the set of bars he is. The set of bars is maybe nine feet wide and, you know, eight or nine feet high. And when he would get to acting up, he'd sit there for hours writing and writing at this little desk. And uh, the other guys were ignoring him. So that night they're watching Saturday Night Special, you know, with all this rock music playing and stuff, and they're enjoying it. And he'd get up and make this real loud speech about how bad television is for you and why you shouldn't watch it. All the things it'll do to you. And they're having fits. They're trying to throw things at him. They can't get at him. They're raging. They're mad because he's destroying the one thing they really enjoy. And he's just having a ball doing this. He'll sit for hours all day writing this two-hour speech, exactly as long as it takes to watch that show. So he'd also sit over there and sing these horrible songs. He couldn't sing a lick at all. And he's singing these horrible songs. And one time I was in the car coming back to Redwood City, and the cop got so upset at the singing he's doing in the back of the station wagon, he turns around with his can of mace. He says, I've had it. Get out of the way, Kemper. And I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. You're going to get me with that stuff. And he's trying to mace the guy in the back of the car because he won't shut up. And he's trying to get him to shut up. And the guy just ignored him. He had this way of really getting in people's nerves. So he'd pull these little stunts, these horrible songs and the speeches and things. And I'd say, Herbie, why do you do stuff like that? And he says, oh, no, I have a right to do what I want to do, too. And, yeah, OK, right. So I started this, what they call be just real basic behavior modification therapy. OK, I'd had a little bit of psychology study. I'd worked in the psych testing area in Atascadero. I knew some of these things. So I set up a very basic and very essential, just bare minimum behavior mod experiment, behavior modification, right? You reward them when they're good, you punish them when they're bad. And if you're absolutely accurate in when you do these things, quick punishment when they do bad and quick reward when they do good, supposedly this is supposed to attack you at a subliminal level, a subconscious level, and you don't have a lot of control over your reactions, that it would improve your behavior, essentially. And then they have these great elaborate experiments, like in Youth Authority when I went through, where they try these things. So what I did is when he was bad, I'd get a cup full of water in a styrofoam cup, and I'd reach around, and I'd throw it on him. And it's embarrassing, and it also gets his papers wet, and, you know. So we got in this cat and mouse game. When he was good, I'd give him peanuts, and I'd try to gas him when he was bad. It's called gassing. Throw this water on him. And he'd duck all over the house. I couldn't figure out where he was at, so I kept missing him. So what I did is I waited one day till I knew he was asleep, or I suspected he was. And I called one of the guys over to the bars from the, uh, the, the, the place in the back, the tank. And I went like this. I went, and I says, and he reads it. And he says, and I says, and I call him over to the bars. And I said, hey, I said, I want to work something out where I can get Herbie with these cups of water. And he can't figure out how I'm doing it. And I says, I just thought of a way. And he says, what's that? And I said, I want you to set up a grid on the bars where you're at put a little piece of string or a little piece of plastic or a little something he won't notice. Count over how many bars there are on his cell, on his cell front, and, and from the wall, go over that far on your set and set up boundaries. And then when I give you a signal that will be a hand signal, very casually walk over. Don't look at me. Just casually walk over and drape yourself on the bars where he's at so I'll know. And if he's back away from the bars, go back that far and position yourself so I, you're, it's a grid. It's targeting grid. So he would do this, and Herbie would hear me turn the water on, or maybe I'd have some already set up, and I would reach through the bars, and I'd blast him, and I got him every time. And he couldn't figure out how all of a sudden I got so accurate, you know? And it was without fail. I'd get him with that water, wham. And, you know, it's embarrassing, and everybody's laughing back there, and good shot, Ed, and all that stuff. And then... I'd ask him if he'd do something, or hey, can we do this, or whatever, you know, and he'd, he'd participate in something with me, I'd give him peanuts. When he's bad, he gets blasted with water. This went on for two or three weeks. And he actually got away from the bad behavior when he said, hey, I want to sing. And I says, well, hey, guy's in the back. Do you mind if he sings? Oh, we don't want to hear that shit. Man. I said, hey, you want to hear it now, or do you want to hear it tonight when you're watching the show? Yeah, okay, so go ahead, Irby, sing. What did, what did you sing? And he'd sing for 30, 40 seconds, and then get bored and say, gee, I don't want you know, because the fun was gone out of it. But the point is, it got a handle on his behavior. And the cops are watching this. The deputies are on camera watching me. I mean, they're on the monitors watching every move I'm making, right? And they're fascinated. They're watching this thing going back and forth with me and Herbie. They're not involving themselves. They're just watching it. 
And after a while, one of them came in and said, Herbie is completely cooperative now. He's not messing around. Because I've been, as, as we're talking, these little frictions out between he and I, I'm showing him some insights into why people don't like him. I'm showing some insights into what his behavior is causing in them. And he had realized by that point that it was just he's reacting to how people are reacting to him and it's just a self-perpetuating thing. And it was the only way he could get out his negative feelings. And I said, well, why don't you pose on the positive? Focus on the positive instead and the negative will go away. I don't think anybody ever did that with him before because he responded real well to it. And later when we were... The trial of Herb Mullins started on July 30th, 1973, with the defendant causing the now expected disturbances and objecting to the proceedings. The formal plea had been entered as not guilty, by reason of insanity. The attention was riveted on the madman, with dark hair, frowning and rocking back and forth slowly in his chair. Throughout the trial proceedings, he displayed a lack of emotion by looking blankly ahead at the wall whenever witnesses testified. Herbie was irritated that his defense was determined to prove that he was insane. Bob Francis provided testimony regarding Herbie's massive intake of LSD, and strangely, Herbie nodded his head in apparent agreement, as if this proved the need to execute Gianera. The mother of Joan Gianera also reported discovering the young married couple dead in the bathroom after they had been shot. Then medical examiners and ballistics experts showed the jury Herbie's violent overkill while Herbie leaned down and took notes. Herbert Mullin then took the stand to explain that his interpretation of Jonah provided the clearest illustration of the responsibility that one had to sacrifice himself or others for the welfare of the community. The thirteenth guy must play the role of the scapegoat and give his life to save the others. He said, I'm asking you to swallow this Jonah story, and believe that a minor natural disaster will avoid a large natural disaster. By sacrificing one individual willing to die, millions of other people who live in the area devastated by the earthquake and tsunami will be spared. While Herbie was on the stand defending himself, one of the reporters observed that he appeared to be striking a lecturer's pose. In the witness box, he presented his many notes and blamed his family, friends, and teachers for wanting to prevent him from becoming too powerful in the next life. Since Albert Einstein passed away on his birthday, he stated, I have been picked as a destined leader of my generation. In addition, gives me an extremely dominant position in the reincarnation, the birthday in question says. He was under the impression that his parents had informed him that they were going to give me a fantastic time in the next life, but they couldn't provide it to me in this life. As Herb Mullen explained to the jury, the designated leader is responsible for convincing enough people to die or consent to be murdered. And to accomplish this, the designated leader and associates must convince enough people to commit suicide or consent to being murdered every day. He then admitted that he could disobey commands to kill and did so on multiple occasions when he was telepathically instructed to commit suicide, but he didn't. In their final argument, the defense said that the jury should consider that Herbie kills people because he has to, but he doesn't know why. The prosecutor stated to the jury that there was no doubt that the defendant suffered from a severe mental illness. Even though he disguised his misdeeds, he crushed his rifles, serial numbers. After deliberating for more than 14 hours, the jury of six men and six women decided that Herbert Mullen was both sane and guilty. The judge announced his decision on August 19, 1973. In Santa Cruz, California, 25-year-old Herbert Mullen was charged with the fatal shootings of six persons in the past three weeks. Herbert Mullen is charged with two counts of first-degree murder because of the killings of Jim Gianera and Kathy Francis, both of which were premeditated. The rest of the killings were classified as impulse killings by the jury, making them second-degree murders. Herbie was serving life sentences for 11 of the 13 murders to which he confessed when he was denied parole many times since he first became eligible in the 1980s. In multiple parole hearings, Mullen blamed the murders on his now deceased parents, whom he accused in 2006 of denying him maturity. When Mullen went before the parole board in March 2021, he admitted to killing the 13 victims, but he said that his parents made him do it because of their inappropriate upbringing. He felt that his parents and sister should be held accountable. 
He lacks insight and shows no true remorse for these brutal murders. In the end, the parole board agreed and extended Mullins' sentence for an additional seven years. He will not be eligible for parole until 2028. Herbert Mullin, the earthquake serial killer, passed away at 75, and he was still blaming different people for his gruesome, unexplained attacks during his crime spree in 1972 and 1973. up here in the hole together and we weren't even supposed to be together they didn't want us together but we were up in the hole together uh, I was the only guy he could talk to a lot of pain inside he had a lot of anguish inside he had a lot of hate inside and it was addressed at people he didn't even know because he didn't dare do anything to the people he knew because he was aware of all of the structure around that and that that would be the end of his life and so I started, the way I found out about these things is I would pose little co uh, comments or questions aimed at him as we're sitting up there on the tier, on the concrete floor, sitting there against the wall, talking to one another. And I would say, uh, how did you feel? You know, what did you, when you bought that little Saturday night special, 22, I says, uh, did you ever go out shooting with that? You know, just target shooting? He says, well, not much. And I say, well, try this on. You loaded it up, you went out, you set up bottles, you set up cans, you set them around in little areas right around close and, and practice shooting them real fast. And he looks at me all shocked, he says, how do you know that? And I said, because that's what I used to do. And those were people, those weren't cans and bottles and you never told anybody. So he got all fascinated about how I was able to read his mind and stuff, I wasn't. I saw a kindred spirit there, somebody who was doing something very similar to what I was doing as a child he went to mental institutions and he went through this, these processes where these doctors told him what was wrong with him and these doctors treated things that they decided were wrong with him and he just sat back very passively and went through these treatments and they had almost no effect on him because he didn't dare say what was really going on in his head because they would cast him off somewhere. He'd be totally separated from the human race and there were certain things he and certain things I enjoyed in being in the human race and being part of the human race we weren't willing to let go of. So that was that, that little desperate hanging on. So here comes these professionals saying, oh, this is wrong with you, little lad, and this is wrong with you, and we're gonna fix this up, and okay, okay, I'm well, and yeah. Goes out and buys a gun and starts killing people. 